Welcome to the Fellowship San Antonio podcast. Our hope is that this podcast will help you to develop a life-changing relationship with God. There's things in all of our lives of which we are afraid. Whether we admit it or not, there are things that make us nervous, things that make us tense, things that make our blood pressure rise, things of which we tremble and fear. There's a word that when I hear it, no matter how much I've thought about it, no matter how much I've prayed, no matter how much I've prepared, no matter how much I've studied, no matter how many times I've gone through it, there's a word that does not conjure up good thoughts and feelings for me. Final exam. How many of you feel good when you hear that word, final exam? Really? Well, you're strange and need therapy. <laughs> Forty years ago, I had an experience of which I still tremble. When I was in Bible college, I took biology. Now, I just want you to know how important biology is when you're in Bible college. This is the first time I've used anything from that class. You got it? Not too important to a theologian, okay? But it was final exam time, and I studied all of my stuff and did all of my preparation. What made me most petrified, now I've gone in and taken final exams before and done well, and other times maybe done less well, but generally you get to fill out your test paper, you turn it in, it gets graded without somebody looking at you, and your grade gets posted anonymously on a board somewhere where you come along and you look at it, and nobody knows. This particular final exam, the professor announced that we were going to make appointments for our final exam. We would meet him at the lab at our appointed time, and there in front of him would be a series of displays set up of which we would go and look in the microscope or look at the dead cat that was laying out there on the counter with a pin in it somewhere or a string to something, and then we would look at him and say what it was. So you would look in the microscope and there was a cell of some sort or some part of a cell that was marked. So it was bad enough that we had to do this, but we had to do it in front of him and then we had to give him the answer, and he was stoic and wouldn't give any, any um, idea of whether you were right or wrong. If you knew it for sure, you knew you were right, but if you were guessing, you didn't know. I said, I came, it was time for me, and I came, and there was a chair outside of the lab, the biology lab, and I sat in it because you had to wait there until the professor came to the door and invited you in. I remember somebody came along that didn't know what was going on, stopped and said, Russell, are you okay? And I said, why do you ask? And they said, you look sick. And I, I said, I'm, I'm waiting for the death chamber here. And I went in, and there were, all, there, were, there were 11 stations set up. Dead cats, dead frogs, microscopes, displays, various different things. And you had to answer 10 questions, and there was one bonus question. Petrified, the final exam. Well, I want you to know I got my degree and I'm here today, so I must have done all right on it, okay? Um, I don't really remember. I just remember feeling good when I walked out. But final exam, not a pleasant thought. The Bible talks about the final day, the final exam, the final judgment, that coming judgment day. And in John's time, this was a subject that petrified people in the Roman Empire and the Greek thought. Because they referred to death or, or the end of all times as, as go, entering into the underworld. And the underworld was a scary place, and it was a day of reckoning, and it was a day of meeting God and answering for who you were. It was a frightening time for everyone, including Christians, because they were influenced by this Greek thought in their time. And, they, and, and the, the people of the Roman Empire and the people that were under Greek thought and even elsewhere in the world, in Egypt they had similar thoughts and fears of the end time and the final reckoning and the final spiritual exam that was to come. John writes to comfort them on that very issue and to comfort you and me. Stand together with me as we read our word from 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. 
Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God, and everyone who does not love doesn't know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. And we know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God that God has for us. And here's the point that John is writing. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. And in this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Thank you. you. may be seated. So John is writing about the coming day of judgment and three reasons that you and I can be confident in the coming day of judgment. Number one, number one, God is love. The Father loves you. The Father loves me. You see, the character or the nature of the Father is to love. We are not coming before a fierce judge. We are coming before a loving God. God isn't love in what he does. He's love in what he is. There's a big difference in doing acts of love because you can stop doing acts of love. But when you are love, when it is your essence, when it is your very nature, it is what you are and you can be no other. Jesus addressed his audience as dear friends or beloved ones, divinely loved individuals. Do you know that that's who you are today? You are in the presence of a father who loves you. You're in the presence of a father who adores you. You're in the presence of a father who carries your picture around in his wallet and shows it off to the angels. Now, I don't know if that's exactly true, but I know that that's the kind of love that the father has for you. The kind of love that God has is an adoring love. Six times a form of the word agape, which is the Greek word for love, divine love, perfect love, is used in the first two verses of this passage alone. Agape is love that is self-sacrificing. In the Roman world, in which John lived, and the churches to whom he wrote existed, in the Roman world, that kind of love, real love, agape love, was never understood as a love from the gods that were directed toward humans. They feared the gods. They worshipped the gods, they sacrificed to the gods, they gave to the gods out of compulsion. But nobody walked around saying, oh, the gods love me. That was not an understanding in John's day. In fact, there was tremendous fear of the gods, and there was no understanding that in any way the gods gave love to humanity. John is saying that the source of all genuine self-sacrificing love is God, and that such love is not bouncing around somehow in the heavens between a myriad of gods. You see, agape was a word that the Greeks used to reference gods loving each other, but not reaching down to earth. And agape is a word that the Bible writers use to describe the Father's love for you and me. It's a love that comes manward from God. It's a love that touches us. But the Greeks understood that term only in reference to kind of how they loved each other in the heavens, the gods, bouncing around up there between them. No, agape love is from God to you and to me. The destination that John has in mind here is John is leading up to our confidence in the day of judgment. And I can be confident, says John, in that day, because I'm going to stand before one who loves me. Right off the bat, I'm not walking in to the presence of an angry God. When judgment day comes, and the Bible says it is appointed to all men once to die, and then comes the judgment, that when I stand before God in judgment, I stand before a God 
who loves me. When I think of a final exam, I don't really think of a professor that loves me. I think of a professor that may love a dead cat's liver, but not me. A professor is going to give me my grade A or F or somewhere in between, depending on what I deserve. No, God doesn't give me what I deserve. Because God's a God of mercy who doesn't give us what we deserve and a God of grace who does give us what we don't deserve. God loves us. That's the very first thing I want you to see in this passage of scripture. That I can be confident in the day of judgment because the God who judges me is a God who loves me. The second thing is the love of the Son. It's interesting in our passage of Scripture here, we have a view of the Trinity. And even though the word Trinity is never used anywhere in Scripture, we see that there is one God who is eternally existent in three persons. Three separate persons, but one God. And the second thing that we see is that, that the love of the Son is poured out upon us. It says in verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. You remember a couple weeks ago, the sermon that was lost was what, is God, God, what does love look like? What does love look like? Well, here we're seeing, number one, that the very nature, the essence of God is to love, but number two, God's love looks like something, and it's extended to us through his son. Jesus has told us that God is love, but how do we know? You see, I can tell my wife that I love her, and maybe every once in a while I call her up because I never see her. I don't live with her. I don't go home. I don't interact. We don't eat together. Just every once in a while I call up and say, Hey, Joy, just wanted you to know I love you. And she'd say, well, when are you going to come home? <laughs> well, I'm not. Just wanted you to know I love you. No. Love has to have some kind of demonstration, right? Love that's not demonstrated isn't love at all. It's just a word. And God doesn't just say that he loves us, and God doesn't just say that he is love in nature or love in essence, but God demonstrates his love to us. And the Bible says this is how God showed his love to us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. He showed his love to us. Love is revealed in the person of Jesus. You see, the gods of the Greeks in the Roman world didn't reveal love to humanity. There was no demonstration of love. They required things of mankind. They required worship according to their mythology. They required sacrificial giving. They required all kinds of things. They required to get from man, but they gave nothing in return. Now, sort of. I mean, they thought, well, this God is the God of fertility, and that God is the God of the harvest, and this God is the God of the sea, and that God is the God of whatever. But there was no direct impact upon their lives that God made a difference in them. That God had done something for them. That God could take away their fear or that God could take away their sin. You see, just so there's no misunderstanding in what John is teaching, he's not saying that Jesus is just another God. In our text here, actually in the King James, in our text here, he calls Jesus the only begotten. In the New International Version, the one and only. We don't use that word begotten a lot. As a matter of fact, when we read through our Bibles, and we, if we have a Bible that says so-and-so begot so-and-so, we skip that whole section, okay? And, and it's not very interesting to us, and we don't even use that word. I never say, you know, um, Ed Schwartz begot Harold Schwartz, who begot Russell Schwartz, who begot David, Paul, Mark, and Aaron Schwartz. I don't use that word. Begotten. What does begotten mean? Monogenes unique, that there is no other one like this. Jesus is not one of many created beings. He is God. And being God, he has a separate personality 
that extends itself to you and to me and came and became a man and dwelt among us and became our atoning sacrifice. The only unique Son of God, the only begotten. Jesus unique is unique, one and only, because he is God sent into our world to give life and love and payment for our sins. So, where am I going with this? Where's John going in our text? Well, John is reminding us that we can have confidence when we come before God in judgment, number one, because God is love, and number two, because God demonstrates it through the forgiveness of our debt, the forgiveness of our sins. But it's interesting because John says something else. He says, dear friends, since God so loved us like this, so we ought also to love one another. Sometimes in our Bible, there are words with great meaning that seem insignificant. One of them is that word ought. We ought also to love one another. In the Greek, the word ought, philo, to owe, to owe money, to be in debt, to have something that is due at a particular time and place. The Bible says, dear friends, dear friends, dear loved ones, do you know that God loved you and you owe that love one to another? Pass it on. Demonstrate it as he demonstrated it to you. We owe love as God's children. So this is love reaching down to us. God is love, but it isn't just a love that dwells up in the heavenly place somewhere. It's love of God that reaches down to humanity on earth and makes a difference in our lives. We have one God, our Father, who in essence is love, and his Son, who is the expression of of love manward. So, before I go on to my last point, confidence in the day of judgment. Now I understand that it is appointed unto men once to die and then comes the judgment. A day of reckoning, a final exam, as it were. And when I go into the presence of God and stand before him, for the final exam, I'm going to stand before one that looks me in the eye. And unashamedly, I look back because I see in him the look of love. The one who loved me. And I see in him the one who paid my debt that I might be righteous and clean and fit to stand in his presence. But then we see the third part of the Trinity because John says, and then there's the love of the spirit that is at work within us and through us. God is love. God's love is revealed through his son, but it becomes real through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It becomes real in the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You see, verse 12 says, no one has ever seen God. Doesn't that kind of complicate things? No one has ever seen God. How can I really know there is a God? How can I really know that God loves me? How can I really know that God has expressed his love to me through his son if no one has ever seen God? Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, we read no one can see God and live. They were afraid in the Old Testament. Moses was afraid of God. There are a couple of times in the Old Testament where we have what's called a theophany or a Christophany, where different individuals see the angel of the Lord when it's all over, it dawns on them, oh my, I just, I just saw God. I'm going to die. Gideon is one of those. There's several others in the Old Testament. All of a sudden, that thought, I've seen God, does that mean I'm going to die? No one has ever seen God, and even they didn't see God. They saw the angel of the Lord or the manifestation that the Lord was allowing them to see. But we haven't seen God. So how do we know that God is real? 
You see, God has never been seen by any of us, and Jesus is no longer visibly present on this earth. But love becomes real when we love one another. God lives in us, and love is made complete in us. Here's the thought. People will see God's love when believers love one another. Your life is the love others will see of God, the love of God that others will see. Your life is the presence of God that others will see. Your life and how you love others is the evidence, it's the proof that God is and that God is real and that God is at work and that God cares and that God reaches out and that God extends himself manward, earthward, to love us. His love becomes real when it flows through me to others by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so John wrote, verse 12, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. The Holy Spirit abiding in my life and yours is proof of God's love. It makes it real. It makes it evident. So we have a destination. John is leading up toward our confidence in the day of judgment. Our confidence in the final exam. Our confidence when we stand before God on the day of reckoning. How can I be confident? Am I going to sit outside the room waiting for my name to be called? trembling in fear, terror all over me? No. No. Because judgment is something to be feared for those who are outside of Christ, but not for those who are in Christ. Judgment is something to be feared that have never discovered the loving forgiveness of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But for those who are covered in his blood, judgments is something different entirely. I'm going to show you in a second. First, John said, in the day of judgment, we're going to stand before one we know, our Father. Our Father who loves us. One time when I was in high school, I got in trouble. Can you imagine that? I played in the band. I grew up playing the trumpet. I played in the marching band. And we were out waiting for the band director on the football field. And one of the guys, there was a flag, and we would play the national anthem, and the flag would go up, you know, during the football games or before the football game. And one of the guys walked up, and he pulled on the rope on the flagpole, and it kind of going back and forth. And... Another one of the guys pulled, came up and pulled on the rope, and back and forth it went. And a whole bunch of guys went up and pulled on the rope. And we were laughing and watching the flagpole. And I walked up and pulled on the rope, and it went over and down to the ground. Broke it right off. About then, the band director showed up. And there I was, guilty and nowhere to run. Well, after school, I mean, I had that feeling inside of me all day. And after school, I went home and just kind of went into my room and didn't say anything. And the band director lived next door. (laughs) Well, there was the doorbell rang, and my mom went to the door, and I could hear Russell tell you what he did in school today. Was along the door shut. And it was announced to me that my dad was going to deal with this. When my dad got, got home, he came, shut the door, 
and said, you broke the flagpole? He said, he said, stay away from me, Samson. <laughs> and forever after that, he called me Samson like I was some muscle man or something. He went up and examined the flagpole and found out it was all rusted at the bottom and basically convinced the school that in the end I'd done them a favor or it was going to fall on somebody's head. It's mighty nice when your judge is your father, folks. It's mighty nice when your judge is a loving father. John wants you to know your judge is a loving father. Now, some of you didn't have a loving father. Some of you had cruel fathers. Some of you had mean fathers. Some of you had fathers that didn't know how to be fathers. But your heavenly father is not that kind of a father. Your heavenly father is a loving father. And because you didn't have a good example on earth does not mean you don't have a good example in heaven. And everything you've ever missed and everything you've ever longed for and everything you've ever wanted in a father, you have in your heavenly father. He's the one who loves you. And the final exam is before the one who loves you. And secondly, we're going to stand before the one who loves us in that day of judgment with the one who paid the debt. With the one who paid the debt. And the father in love is going to look at you and say, why should you come into my heaven? And the one next to you, your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is going to say, oh, he, oh, she, they get to go in because I covered the price of admission for them. And then the father, and I'm exaggerating, okay? Give me a little room to exaggerate. The father's going to look at the list of offenses. He's going to open the book to your page and say, well, there's nothing here. It's been blotted out. And Jesus is going to say, because I paid the price of admission. And then third, the Holy Spirit is going to be there saying, and all through their life I made it real, because the love you have for them and the love the Son has for them is love that flowed into them and out of them to those around See, love is made complete. Verse 17 says in this way, love is made complete among all of us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. And I love verse 18, there's no fear in love. There's no fear in love. So do I fear the final exam? No, I don't. Do I fear the judgment day? No, I don't. Because there's no fear in love because it's going to be an experience of love for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And folks, judgment doesn't have anything to do with punishment. Not for you and me. Not for those who are in Christ Jesus. Judgment whoop, has to do. Judgment. Oh, I gotta, I, I'm got i going to say this one last thing. There's all this stuff on, on, on the, um, the media today about the Mayan calendar. 12-21-12. Judgment Day, the end of the world. Spiritual things don't operate according to some man-made hoax, folks. And the Mayan calendar is a man-made hoax. God doesn't operate according to those things. But there will be an end of all things. Judgment Day will come. And will it be a day of fear or will it be a day of faith? Huh. It's homecoming. That's what it is for you and for me and for those who are in Christ Jesus. Judgment Day is not a day of fear. It's a homecoming celebration. When the Father reaches out to us and says, come, my love, come, my child. So John is saying, all of this about love so that we can understand that our God is not the God of the Greek world or the Roman world or the Egyptian world or the ancient world in any way. 
We're not entering into an underworld. God is calling us home forever and forever. In this we have confidence. God is love. Jesus is God's proof of that love. And the Holy Spirit is alive within us, demonstrating that love moment by moment that we might know and never forget that we are his beloved children. Pray together with me. Father, I thank you for confidence that we have in Christ Jesus. We don't need to fear the end of this world. We don't need to fear a coming day of judgment. Because our judgment has already taken place and our sins have already been nailed to the cross and payment has been made. Father, how I thank you that you love us and your arms are spread wide to welcome us home.